Hey, everyone, and welcome. Well, we give everybody a couple of minutes to join. We invite, uh, invite you to open up the chat and tell us where you're joining us from today. Hopag in Ethica, New York, Astoria, New York, Brooklyn, Ontario, snowy Rochester. Yeah, I heard we're getting some snow out there in central New York today. Oh, good. The New Mexico Land Conservancy in Santa Fe, it's from Connecticut, Midtown Manhattan, Washington State. Hi, Peg. Hi, Mom. Syracuse. And Marshall, it's been noted that you've changed your hat. <laughs> so uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Rich Merritt, and I'll be your host today. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Audubon State Offices of both Connecticut and New York. And Audubon's mission is protect birds in the places we all need, uh, on our working lands, on our coasts, and across local communities. Um, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be uh, immediately available on our Facebook pages and our YouTube page. When I say immediately, I don't think, uh, but maybe wait till tomorrow morning. Um, questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, and we'll have time at the end for question and answers. Um, now I will pass the mic to Suzanne Traeger, the Forest Program Manager for Audubon New York, to introduce our speaker. Hi, Suzanne. Thanks, Rich. Um, our presenter today is Marshall Johnson, and I'm really excited to introduce Marshall and learn about his work. Um, we're both involved in Audubon's Working Lands Conservation Strategy, where we work with landowners and land managers and others to improve habitat for birds experiencing major population declines. And I know we'll learn a lot about uh, his important work today. Marshall serves as Vice President of the National Audubon Society where for the past decade, he's worked to build rural and urban community-focused habitat and ecosystem programs. He has a business degree from the University of Minnesota and strives to bring conservation into the 21st century, creating eco-friendly profit centers and urban habitat initiatives driven by the ecosystem services they provide to communities. In the last six years, Marshall and his teams have raised and leveraged more than $44 million and partnered with over 400 farmers and ranchers to promote conservation, bird welfare, and positive ecosystem development. And the groundbreaking market-based conservation ranching program now enrolls more than 3.5 million acres across 130 ranches since its creation in 2016. Super impressive. Marshall's pioneering work in the Dakotas brings farmers, ranchers, retailers, and consumers together with grasslands, herds, and birds into win-win alignment. Additionally, creating safe passage and respite for wildlife and wild humans within an urban context has been a priority of Audubon Dakota under Marshall's leadership. With the new program, with the program now managing the largest urban conservation program in the Northern Great Plains. And today Marshall will be speaking to us about the science behind Audubon's conservation ranching initiative and how the decisions that you make about your diet and purchasing power can directly increase bird habitat. Um, and with that, thank you for joining our webinar today. And I'm going to hand things over to our presenter, Marshall Johnson. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Rich. And I really appreciate being here and having this opportunity to talk to you about something that's incredibly uh, inspirational to me and incredibly important to me, grasslands. And if I seem overly enthusiastic, it's because I am, and any opportunity to think about and talk about and share the work related to grassland birds is um, always a really uh, uh, honor, really honor for me to do. Um, I've been with Audubon, uh, I really know no other professional uh, life than being an Audubonner. Uh, I started with Audubon when I was 21 years old and have been here for 13 years. So straight out of college where I studied actually business management and uh, discovered birds and particularly grassland birds uh, while out uh, in a prairie chicken blind one morning. And that sort of uh, serendipitous route to birds um, uh, connected me back to a passion that I had growing up. And that was spending a lot of time 
in West Texas and Eastern New Mexico. Uh, I grew up between Dallas and, and California and, and we moved around a lot. And what I always remembered were those grasslands and the cattle and the birds. And I never thought much about uh, grassland birds then and never imagined that I would be here uh, speaking to you about grassland birds, but it really has been a life calling for me. And I can say the same for the uh, incredible professionals that I have a chance to work alongside of throughout the country from the Central Valley of California to the Driftless region of Wisconsin. And what binds us together is a common passion for grassland birds a sense of urgency, and I'll talk a little bit about why we have that sense of urgency. And I, if there's one thing I want to sort of share with you and, 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 and uh, encourage you is to have a sense of urgency about grasslands and about grassland birds. And I'll touch on a little bit um, of why that is and start to think about and encourage you to uh, use your superpower and your superpower being your ability to choose, um, your ability to make food choices that can directly impact grassland birds. Um, some of this that I'll go over will be counterintuitive for you. It was certainly counterintuitive for me and how I thought about uh, cattle as I got, uh, I got older and lived in a big city and um, thought about and heard about the impacts of cattle on the landscape. And it wasn't until I uh, spent time with birders and spent time with ornithologists um, beginning my career uh, 12 or 13 years ago that I really started to understand this symbiotic relationship between um, large herbivores and ruminants and grasslands and more generally how important grasslands are for North America, being one of North America's uh, uh, most ubiquitous native ecosystems. And so some of this uh, will be a little bit counterintuitive. I think when I think back to when we started this uh, concept, the idea in and of itself was a bit uh, counterintuitive. So I really appreciate you all taking the time to um, have this conversation. I want to finish early uh, so that we can exchange ideas. Um, you all can tell me what you think. Uh, please uh, ask questions. We encourage it. We've been at this for about eight or nine years uh, and launched the Conservation Ranching Initiative um, officially uh, roughly uh, four or five years ago now. Uh, and we're incredibly excited about it and uh, we feel like we have a job to do. The private landowners that are, are working on the project have a, a role to play and a job to do. And you as bird lovers and we all of us as nature lovers um, have an important role in this. And so uh, I really appreciate you joining me and um, a lot of the work here, it's not just my work, it's the work of uh, in 50 or so incredible Audubon professionals and partners out on the landscape. So. Um, I'm going to jump into it. Let's see. Again, some of the things that we'll talk about today, um, I, I look at grasslands as America's ecosystem. Uh, and uh, I will try to limit the amount of geeking that I will do on, on, gra on grasslands because I'm so passionate about them. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Audubon's Conservation Ranching Initiative. Um, a food certification uh, that incentivizes and sets a standard for grassland bird management uh, through private landowners. Uh, and our goal is to incentivize the type of grassland management and cattle management and bison management that produce the most birds. And I'll touch on how we track that, how we measure outcomes. Uh, when, when we say or or put a product out there with the Audubon Green Seal that says it's raised on bird-friendly land, we have to make sure that has meaning. And I'll talk, talk a little bit about how we go about ensuring that. Um, but the biggest part of this is you. 
the biggest part of, of this is, uh, as I alluded to, that superpower that we, we have um, in making choices that are tied to uh, various pr production standards. Uh, Aldo Leopold actually uh, uh, put a, a essay in the Audubon magazine uh, more than 80 or 90 years ago uh, that touched on how we can make better choices that incentivize and encourage great land management. You know, this is the scene that, that sort of brought me to grasslands and brought me to the Audubon Society and inspired in me a uh, passion for grassland conservation. And this was, uh, uh, you, you find this scene playing out right now across the Midwest, uh, uh, prairie chicken uh, lex and grouse lex, whether they're uh, uh, sage grouse or graders or lesser prairie chickens, sharp-tailed grouse in, in my part of the, the world uh, here in uh, North Dakota. Uh, you see this scene playing out. Oftentimes, I've seen this scene playing out um, most often on, in pastures uh, with cattle maybe a little bit uh, off to the side or in hay fields. And I've always been curious about, and maybe you've been curious about, that relationship between uh, the cattle, the bison, and the grassland birds. Um, and, and not studying uh, biology in college, um, I've, I've really spent a lot of time listening and learning alongside some of the most brilliant grassland bird ecologists and grassland ecologists uh, in the Northern Great Plains, and I'm incredibly uh, grateful for that. Grasslands uh, uh, have, have a special place, again, in my heart, not only because I'm drawn to uh, uh, their journey and, and, and uh, the, their songs, but uh, in, in many ways, I think of grassland birds as sort of the troubadours and songstresses of the sky. Um, I feel like they're my playlist when I'm out in nature. Uh, and, and I'm in, incredibly uh, grateful for their uh, songs and, and their uh, companionship. And I, and I hope many of you uh, feel that same way, maybe about warblers or about whatever birds um, are in the places that, that you enjoy nature the most. For me, it's grasslands. And so this work, as we look at uh, grassland birds and what's been illuminated by recent studies, uh, grassland birds are without a doubt the most imperiled species of birds in North America. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you expand that view out, we've, since Earth Day, right, since what we think of as sort of the pinnacle of environmental awareness, we've lost nearly 800 million grassland birds in that time. And that's only actually a snapshot of the crisis, as, as it were. Uh, when you look at shorebirds like piping plovers and marbled godwits, long-billed curlews, uh, these, these shorebirds actually nest in wetlands and alkali flats that are oftentimes, in my part of the world, surrounded by grassland. So it's actually a bigger issue than just grassland birds. And it's bigger than wildlife. And I'll, I'll touch on that. A little bit as well, but grasslands are, uh, and how, and, and what we do about grassland conservation uh, is incredibly important to preserving uh, their song and preserving uh, the vital eco ecosystem role that they play. Uh, my friend from Nebraska, Audubonner Bill Tadigan, always says, you know, the saddest words in the English language are, you should have been there. And I would hate uh, to 20 or 30 or 40 years from now, um, tell my kids or my grandkids uh, that you should have been there to listen to the bobolinks return to the prairie uh, in the Northern Great Plains every year. Uh, you, sh you should have uh, been there to hear the songs of the meadowlarks on every other fence row as you drive down a dirt trail. Um, and so that's what we, uh, those of us that uh, work on grassland conservation issues, we wake up every day sort of thinking about what we can do to bend this curve 
um, that is showing we only have a little, a limited amount of time to preserve America's grasslands. I live, I'm uh, uh, with you today from Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I've lived in, I started as a part-time, uh, 15 hours a week, uh, field organizer, outreach uh, coordinator, working with local chapters here in uh, 2008 or 2009, uh, right here in Fargo, North Dakota. And I'm in what is called the Prairie Pothole region. And you can see the uh, Prairie Pothole expanse there. Uh, and, and this is sort of a time lapse over the last uh, 70 to 80 years and you can see the grasslands, um, what is happening. Over time, we've lost in the Northern Great Plains in the plot, Prairie Pothole region, this incredibly diverse landscape. We've lost more than 90% of the Prairie Pothole region habitat, the grasslands, uh, the wetland habitat that makes this so, so special. Uh, nearly 50% of America's ducks are uh, produced right here. Shorebirds, grassland birds, it's sort of our biodiversity Serengeti right here in the middle of the country. Uh, and I take a lot of pride in that, uh, the importance of this landscape for biodiversity, for our river systems, our streams, tributaries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is sort of the epicenter of that. And we've lost so much of this habitat over the last uh, 80 years. And we've seen that show up in the loss of grassland birds um, over the last 50 years, which has been noted by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's 3 billion birds report. And for many of us, we've seen this sort of viscerally firsthand, uh, grasslands here today, gone tomorrow sort of, um, a sad story. And when you look out over the expanse of this ecosystem and the various ecoregions, uh, we've lost roughly half of America's grasslands in the last hundred years. Uh, and when we lose grasslands, we not only lose uh, the grassland birds, but grasslands play such a vital ecosystem service to all of us. Uh, whether it's storing or sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere, uh, filtrating and storing water and slowly discharging that water to our river streams and tributaries, our pollinator habitat. When we think about pollinators declining, native bees and butterflies, grassland birds, um, the emittance of carbon into the atmosphere, a lot of that is tied to and driven by the loss of grassland habitat. We can't afford to lose much more of this uh, grassland habitat. And when you look at what's left, uh, the reason in, in most cases that that grassland habitat is still there is because of ranchers. 90% um, of our remaining grasslands are either owned or managed by cattle ranchers, by bison ranchers. And uh, much of this is private lands, particularly in the middle portion of the country. Uh, when, when and if they sell their cattle, oftentimes the next thing that happens is a breaking of that native prairie, planting that to uh, uh, production plants, corn, beans, uh, soybeans, um, and the grassland habitat uh, is removed from the landscape. And that chain of thousands of years that that has been home for grassland birds uh, is broken. Uh, and this is really linked to our, what we eat, um, energy production. Uh, all of this is inner, inextricab in, inextricably linked to our food supply. And that's sort of what we, uh, the, the background for why we start to think about a conservation ranching uh, certification and um, embedding, and you think about a certification, we're embedding the ethos and science of bird conservation into the supply chain. Oftentimes the work that we do in grassland conservation is not necessarily attached to the main driver of land use decisions. And seven or eight years ago when we started to conceptualize this idea, 
it was for that main reason that the decisions that are driving habitat off of the landscape are tied to food production. Why not produce food in a way that is bird friendly or can be bird friendly and track those results and give a sort of sticker, a sticker, a beacon for people who love birds, care about birds, um, and want to be a part of the solution and can be a part of the, the solution, uh, sort of a beacon for them to uh, find support and having a sense of trust that uh, that support is going to lead to uh, helping us bring our birds back. So what do, I, what do I mean by that, right? Um, and, and this is uh, so counterintuitive to uh, what I envision, my thoughts growing up. Um, this is a pasture in central North Dakota. And like so many pastures, and, and the story I'm going to tell you is a story that plays out across roughly 1 million acres of grassland every single year more than 1 million acres of grassland habitat is lost every year in the United States. It's a ecosystem uh, uh, disappearing act uh, that is in many years eclipses what's happening in the Amazon. Uh, one day, uh, this is a field again in, in the Prairie Pothole region. One day, the picture up top is a thriving grassland, home to uh, uh, you know, thousands of grassland birds. Uh, the field to the right here is a hay field where you could find uh, upland sandpipers and ducks and geese. And uh, in this part of the world, that's also habitat for migrating sandhill and whooping cranes, uh, this, these wetlands over here. And then in the blink of an eye, uh, this dirt is turned over, that chain of habitat and that story of birds is wiped off the landscape and again the blink of an eye. These wetlands oftentimes become uh, 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 encroached upon by sedimentation and erosion from this, this crop field. And never again will grassland birds uh, uh, use that as home. So when uh, I try to encapsulate this, which again was very counterintuitive for me, I, I always had the idea um, or was told that uh, without question, cattle and uh, uh, sheep are bad for the environment. And what I learned in joining Audubon and working alongside of, of some of America's uh, uh, preeminent grassland bird conservationist was the story was far more nuanced than that. There was more to the story and partnerships with our cattle ranchers to help them revitalize and to manage their cattle in a way that was actually beneficial for the landscape was actually a big part of the solution. Um, not to say that uh, what you just saw in this kind of breakdown of kind of grasslands, the grasslands being broken up and then becoming, uh, a, in this case, a, a bean field. Um, this is a different uh, side of the same coin when you think about uh, the Amazon rainforest and the rainforest being burned and, and cleared for agricultural production. Uh, the bottom line is we shouldn't do it. Um, we need farmland, farmland's essential, but we have reached a tipping point where further encroachment into our grasslands um, are, are driving a catastrophe for our grassland songbirds. And so to encapsulate this into uh, one, again, uh, for me today, it's still a sort of counterintuitive uh, phrase, no cows, no grass, no birds. Uh, it's not, it's less about the cows and what I've learned and what we've embedded in this program is it's really about how the cows are managed and how we can manage the cows in grazing patterns through rest and rotation and leaving uh, grassland habitat on the landscape 
for birds to have when the spring returns, that's actually a, a very vi scientifically viable way to help bring birds back. And there's a, a inextricable link between having the cows on the landscape and uh, having the grassland birds. And again, this was made, I saw this sort of firsthand when I would uh, help organize various birding festivals and uh, birding trips, people would come in from all across the country, Connecticut and New York and different places. And they had life birds that they have never seen before. And whenever we, tr uh, I'd work with the various uh, uh, land manager managers to make sure that they got those life birds, we were going to pastures. I noticed more and more we were going to pastures, the cows were there, uh, and that's where we were finding the chestnut collar long spurs and the sprigs pipit, um, et cetera, et cetera, were in those pastures. And it, it really brought home to me uh, in sort of real time that there was this link and that fostering that link and making it good for the cattle rancher, making it good for in a very measurable way, the grassland birds was something we really needed to um, uh, look at. And again, it's not just birds. Um, the pollinators, the birds are all linked to this ecosystem. And as we lose this ecosystem, uh, we lose so much more. And obviously the bees and the, the pollinators would have something to say about that. So what is conservation ranching? Uh, ostensibly it's a food certification. Uh, we start with a set of practices uh, that are really four main categories. Uh, habitat management. So each ranch agrees to develop a habitat management plan with an Audubon range ecologist. And at the center of that management is a focus on target grassland bird species and the grassland circumstances and management needed to incentivize uh, the health of those grassland bird species. Uh, so this is a grass-fed pasture-raised uh, program. And so the animals are not uh, confined to feeding. Uh, they graze out on the landscape. Uh, there are no antibiotics or growth hormones that are permitted. Uh, the uh, animals, uh, there's no neonicotinoid pesticides that are permitted. Um, and there's a clear link between neonicotinoid pesticides, which are found on most uh, plant-based crops uh, and, and the decline of our insect populations like butterflies and bees. And so there's a list of things that each ranch uh, signs up, agrees to, and we have a third party auditor that makes sure and holds uh, them accountable to those commitments that they are making by entering into this program. And what we seek to do with that focus on habitat management, forage and feeding, uh, we believe it's a, a part of being regenerative and bird friendly is caring for the livestock as well. So the habitat, there's a section in our protocols that speak directly to how uh, the humane uh, animal handling and welfare needs to be conducted, as well as local environmental sustainability. What do I mean by that? Environmental, uh, uh, a common problem that we see on cattle ranches, and we uh, work to facilitate changes around, um, uh, has to do with the cattle having unmitigated access to rivers, streams, and tributaries. So we work with the ranchers to fence out those areas so the cattle have limited or no access to those areas. And that helps with erosion, water quality, um, and a whole list of ecosystem and environmental services that can be enhanced just by changing that, the, those particular uh, practices. And in doing so, we're trying to create a link between real outcomes for birds and wildlife and the ecosystem and you people who care about birds, who are constantly thinking about ways, whether it's calling your congressman, supporting various uh, bills and, and, and 
uh, pieces of state and federal legislation, uh, you're always thinking and asking of ways that you can be a part of the solution. That was really at the heart of creating this program is availing you a new tool uh, to be a part of this uh, solution, be a part of bringing our songbirds back. And over the last uh, five years, we've enrolled more than three and a half million acres in the conservation ranching program. Uh, these are 150 cattle and bison ranches that have agreed to this strict set of standards uh, that uh, our science shows is helping bring back birds and increase bird habitat and bird populations as scale. This is the largest regenerative uh, 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 grazing program uh, in the country. And uh, for it to be backed by Audubon, we really expect a lot out of the partic participating ranchers, the brands and retailers who sell uh, products raised with the Audubon Green Seal. Um, it's available in more than 1,400 points of purchase. Most importantly, um, it's available in all of the lower 48 uh, states uh, to your doorsteps. Uh, you are basically two clicks away from, um, if you choose our uh, beef in any way as a part of your diet or your neighbor's diet, um, it's a way for you to directly influence grassland bird outcomes. and. Um, uh, this was built with a, uh, on, on the latest grassland bird and um, grassland science, uh, but it was really important to us and it has been really important to us to monitor this over time as well. And just kind of a visual of what we mean by regenerative uh, bird friendly grazing, uh, what we are uh, asking and facilitating the ranchers doing instead of having the, the cattle, one of the big differences between cattle and bison, bison are really grazing animals that um, don't loaf. You know, they may uh, uh, spend a little bit more time in the uplands and the low lying areas, they, they tend not to, to loaf and uh, focus in on maybe one group of, of plants that they really enjoy. They tend to eat and move on cattle tend to loaf a lot more. So it's really about the management, moving the animals, ensuring that the pastures have adequate rest and rotation. Oftentimes our producers may graze a sale, um, graze a pasture and not return to that pasture for more than a year's time or more. Uh, so rest rotation is a big part of being a great, a bird friendly uh, operation uh, and also reducing the amount of inputs. What do I mean by inputs? Chemicals. Uh, a big part of reducing or enhancing our insect and uh, populations on each ranch is being really thoughtful about re reducing and the reduction of uh, chemical uses um, and really being thoughtful about just using certain uh, chemicals as a very limited tool and a means to transition uh, to other natural forms of uh, weed management uh, and, and other management that are vital to uh, maintaining healthy grasslands. So what have we found? Uh, one of the uh, incredible uh, uh, things that we've been able to do through the program, and I would give so much thanks to Nicole Michael and uh, the team that created the Bird Friendliness Index is we've been able to track uh, how uh, the bird populations are doing on each ranch over time. And what we've found so far is that uh, over the course of the first four years of launching this program, the average grassland bird abundance has increased by 36%. And when we compare the data of a conservation ranching ranch, uh, Audubon certified ranch to nearby landscapes, we see that the conservation ranching uh, uh, locations, the ranches that are enrolled in this program are producing more birds 
greater bird diversity. And we will continue to monitor that because having that data to back up uh, uh, the program to justify the scaling of this program is really vital to the overall success. And it's important to us that uh, bird lovers that buy into this program that make this transition that in some cases might pay a little bit more for the beef, know that they are directly supporting better grassland bird outcomes. That's, that's essential to the overall success of the program. Uh, starting in uh, 2021, we're also going to be uh, implementing soil, soil carbon monitoring and soil health monitoring across all of our ranches, gathering that data and feeding that data into the year-to-year -year management, uh, habitat management plans that we facilitate alongside our enrolled ranches. You know, we, we, we say with the conservation ranching program uh, that it's better for the land, better for you. Uh, and we really mean that. Um, and, and I often uh, am asked, and I think it's a real important question for uh, those of us that are involved in this program, what's the program about and what, it's, what is it not about? Uh, one thing that, it, it, that underscores everything that we do with the conservation ranching program, our broader working lands initiatives, uh, is, is all about scaling uh, the restoration of America's grasslands. That's the point. That's why we're in it. That's why we launched this program. That's why we, we do this work. That's why the ranchers have that have enrolled in this program uh, do this work and agree to these standards. Um, what is, I think, an equally important question is, is, is what we're not doing and what we're not after. Uh, one of the things that we're constantly asked, and I think it's a great question, is, um, is Audubon doing this for money? for revenue? And the answer is no. Um, there is no charge uh, or no uh, fee for ranchers enrolling in the program. This is not a pay to play uh, program. Unlike uh, many food certifications, there is no cost associated for neither the brands that carry the Audubon certification nor the ranchers enrolled in the certification. We always want the enrollment and the retention of our brands and ranches to come back to the science and nothing else. Um, and creating that firewall between uh, those resources and the, the da data and science, we've always felt that that is one of the most important things that Audubon can bring to the table, the integrity. Um, and it's not Audubon certifying these ranches. Uh, Food Alliance, which is a, uh, a professional food auditing uh, firm, they actually conduct the certification audits on all of our ranches. So that integrity has to be a part of it. Um, and at the end of the day, we're here to create a scalable program to turn back that, that, that arc that we saw in terms of the loss of grassland. And it, it, it has been a, a real journey. And um, the most important part in, in this whole equation um, are you, people that care about birds, that want to help be a solution to the grassland bird um, uh, crisis. And this is a direct link between the decisions that you make and the habitat that either remains on the landscape is degraded or is, disappears from the landscape. Um, it's really an important time for us to all, um, as best we can, link these outcomes, uh, uh, link our intentions and our values back to the food and energy uh, uh, sector. Uh, so with that, uh, I would, uh, I'm always asked the question, well, where can I find this? Um, I would encourage you to uh, visit bluenestbeef.com. This is a brand partner that was created for the sole purpose of sourcing only from Audubon certified ranches uh, or go to audubon.org backslash bird friendly and you can find local 
uh, brands, market partners, farmers markets, uh, whether it's the Red River Farmers Market here in Fargo, North Dakota, where you find the, the Prairie Soul Meats and the Sand Ranch or Bismarck, North Dakota, California. There's so many local options uh, to find uh, uh, these products that are raised in this manner and certified through the conservation ranching program. Um, I always say, you know, do what you can to put the pot, whether it's this or uh, other uh, uh, bird friendly uh, initiatives, put the power in your purchase um, and uh, incentivize ranchers, farmers that are thinking about birds in a deliberate way um, uh, over uh, options that aren't. So with that, I will take any questions, Suzanne, Rich. Yeah, Marshall, that was great. Well, that was a really wonderful and informative presentation. I, and um, I, I learned a lot. That was very eye-opening. I think others may find the same, uh, the same thing because as you said, you know, we kind of looked at, look at this issue kind of cut and dry of what we've heard over the years. Yeah, cows are bad. And uh, like you said, also, you know, there is a lot more nuance to it. So I learned an awful lot today. I think many of us did. So, yeah, um, we're prepared to have some questions. If anyone has any more, please uh, use the chat and we'll get to as many as we can with the time we have remaining. Um, and Suzanne and I are joined uh, today to help facilitate the, um, the question and answer period is, uh, with us is Chris Wilson. He's Audubon's director of the Conservation Ranching Program. So thank you for joining us, Chris. Great to be here. Uh, it's been great looking at some of you guys' questions. I've been trying to answer a few of those directly. Uh, one of these that I might throw at you, Marshall, that I think is important is one of the viewers has asked, what is in it for the farmers outside of goodwill? How might you inspire a hesitant farmer to want to participate? Absolutely. Uh, so I think it's two main uh, two or three main uh, answers to that. Number one, um, it's really important that we avail the technical assistance and science and expertise to um, help facilitate the changes that are necessary to be more bird friendly. So that's, that's number one that we always uh, hear from our ranching partners. Um, you want us to change? Give us, empower us with the knowledge to change um, and partner with us. So that's number one. Um, number two would be financial incentive. Uh, the products raised with the Audubon Green Seal uh, will cost a little bit more. And what are you paying for? Um, again, it's not coming to Audubon. Um, it's, it's going back to the ranches to help support the financial viability of these ranches and to cost share the amount of time, you know, to do rotational grazing. Sometimes a, a ranch, ranches that we work with, they're going from moving their cattle maybe three to five times a year to 15 to 20 times a year, right? To uh, facilitate that sort of um, grazing methodology that is syncing with nature in a way that large herbivores, whether it was elk or bison would have done thousands of years ago. So maintaining that sinking takes a lot more work, um, uh, takes a lot more uh, uh, effort. Uh, and so these products do cost a, a, a cost more. Uh, and and uh, that's an incentive, a strong incentive uh, to keep these lands managed in a bird friendly manner. So those, those are two things, but I, I'll always tell you that when, when we started this program and we were uh, thinking about this initiative, we'd always ask that question, what would it take for you to change to a more bird-friendly grazing regime? One of the most important things they always said to us before money, before technical assistance was help us tell the story. We're not out here wanting to destroy the habitat to poison our rivers we want to be, we want to change. We want to show people um, and, and that we're, we can do better. We will do better. Help us tell our story. And, and those are, I think, the three main things that we try to do is uh, help facilitate the changes, encourage folks to seek out these products, and, and yes, maybe pay a little bit more if you can, 
for uh, beef raised on Audubon certified land and share that this, we hear so much negativity. There's a positive story that's happening. And I see it every day I'm out on one of these farms and ranches that are certified by Audubon. Okay, Marshall, I have a few questions here asking about um, conservation partnerships and um, in particular with Ducks Unlimited, if you've worked with them or um, if, they, if they're involved in any way in your, in your work. Yeah, quite a bit. We, we really enjoy working with our partners at Ducks Unlimited on a broad range of, of grassland work uh, and they are incredibly supportive of the Audubon Conservation Ranching Initiative um, and other partners include Pheasants Forever Pheasants Forever in some parts of the, the country actually delivers the conservation ranching program through their network of private lands uh, biologists. And so uh, the, I have to give a very special shout out to the Missouri Department of Conservation. There is no conservation ranching initiative without the great folks in Missouri. Uh, and, and they actually deliver the program on the ground in the state of Missouri. Uh, and so we have a number of really fantastic partners and the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies developed the IMBCR bird monitoring tool and it's sort of the Cadillac of bird monitoring and we implement that bird monitoring across all of our ranches or in the case of Missouri, the Missouri uh, 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 River Bird uh, Observatory, they have a methodology that we use. So partnerships are from the ground up are really key to this program. And Marshall, I got one from our friend Peg Olson, and I don't know if this is an offer, but um, she does ask, do you need philanthropic support to maintain this excellent program? Yes, uh, as I, uh, thank you, Peg. Um, <laughs> and I wonder if that's the Peg I'm thinking about. Um, sure it is. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I would, yes. Um, as I alluded to in uh, the presentation, we thought it was really important to build this program not tied to the any type of fees or cost share with our brand or ranching partners and we wanted this program to rest on the science and what we've seen it's a, it's an incredibly uh, cost effective way uh, by letting and encouraging and allowing the market to drive the incentives uh, it's an incredibly efficient way to scale grassland bird conservation. Uh, but to do that, private individuals, foundations, um, uh, the U United States uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, different agencies that are chipping in, you, those of uh, you that are listening today, you are incredibly important to the financial viability of us continuing to, to deliver this program. So uh, great question from my uh, 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 former uh, supervisor, Peg Olson. Yeah, Marshall, uh, we've got a question related to product availability, specifically as to whether it'll ever be available in grocery stores in the Eastern part of the country. Absolutely, uh, that's a great question. And the answer is yes, um, this year, with our partnership with Panorama Meats. Um, it's the largest grass-fed organic gra uh, uh, brand in the country. Uh, that is going to expand the availability of the green, Audubon's Green Seal to uh, more than 700 grocery stores nationwide. And you're gonna find those across uh, the upper Midwest, the East Coast, um, uh, and just about everywhere in the United States. But Again, um, with a couple clicks, you can go to Blue Nest Beef and have um, be, uh, beef raised with the Audubon seal delivered to your front door within a matter of days. So um, there's a lot of different options uh, to uh, taking part and being a part of this movement. Okay, I've got a question here. How much is producer participation driven by demand or increased price in the marketplace? And if this, and could this program ever get too successful, for example, have too many participating producers such that the market advantage is eroded? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great, great question. Um, 
uh, this is driven by consumer demand. This is driven by uh, really two things, the awareness of America's 48 million birders uh, and, and their participation in market-based conservation. That's the more people care, the more people put their, the power in their purchase, the more people buy into this, the more ranches and the more land and the more birds we can bring back. There's, uh, in market-based conservation, it, it is supply and demand. And the more demand we have, the more ranches we can impact. Um, I think long-term, uh, that's, a, that's a, a good problem I'd like to have. If you know the uh, majority of our 48 million birders are already bought in uh, and uh, we have too many, too much product, too many ranchers. That's certainly a, a, a problem I'd love to have one day. And um, I think there's, there's always a, a point where you will erode the premium that is found to a certain degree. But what we always heard from and continue to hear from our ranches, uh, it's not so much that the premium is the most important thing it's having access to the market. So um, I think we have a long way to go and a lot of great impact before we start worrying about oversupply. Kosher, another... kosher beef, not yet. Are you thinking about it? Sure, absolutely. Had a good question about fire. Um, do you incorporate it in any way in the rotational grazing or as a way to manage the grasslands? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a great question. Um, fire, uh, most of the uh, uh, native grasslands and ranch lands are fire, are adapted to fire, and fire is a really important component. Um, in in North, North Dakota, for instance, we launch uh, the really first ever private lands fire cooperative, which provides uh, uh, cost share uh, to landowners to do a habitat friendly prescribed fire on their land. And that's available to our conservation ranchers as well. Uh, we certainly, uh, there's a list of different things within our habitat management plans that we try to identify as uh, improvements that we will help facilitate over time um, in partnership with our ranches. And FIRE is one of those that um, we are always looking to uh, provide cost share, incentives, technical assistance to encourage uh, the adoption and, and uh, implementation of FIRE practice because it is essential um, to both grassland birds, but really specifically it's essential for pollinators who depend on the wildflowers and forbs uh, that are found within grasslands. And those tend to respond actually um, more favorably to fire. Yeah, Marshall, <clears throat> we got a question about where we work. A couple questions about where we work as far as where the ranches are and are there ranches in Vermont, for example? Uh, not yet, uh, and, but where, where we work, uh, it's, we, we've tried to uh, really scale the program in those areas that are seeing the greatest habitat loss. So where we have the sort of dividing lines between in the last holdouts of grassland bird habitat. Um, and so that, that tends to be in the middle part of the country, the Central Valley, uh, the South, um, but uh, gra the grassland stretched all the way into the Ohio River Valley and beyond. And there are other places that eventually we will look to expand the program uh, over time uh, and in the Southeast for, for uh, example. Uh, but we kind of started where we had two state offices or three state offices, offices that were willing to really invest in the research and development of the program in areas where uh, we're seeing the greatest um, pace of habitat loss. 
I have a question from a prospective graduate student who wants to know, are there any research gaps um, or current research project needs in the field of conservation ranching? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, two, I would say. Number one, we want to become more sophisticated. Uh, this program was really launched around grassland birds, and we've built a really rigorous grassland bird monitoring and uh, analysis and evaluation uh, methodology. Uh, where I would like to see additional gaps filled are how we can tweak management to support specifically pollinator outcomes. Uh, and so for birds and, and bees and, and how we can better track that over time. I think that's an incredible opportunity given the scale of the conservation ranching program. Uh, secondly, uh, I think it's really important that we um, monitor, as I alluded to, we're going to be monitoring across all of our ranches, uh, the soil uh, health and soil carbon sequestration uh, within under our ranches and um, how that ties to um, uh, how habitat health ties into water filtration and water quality, I think is an important gap that we seek to uh, feel over time. And, and we need great uh, technicians and researchers like you uh, to help fill that. So uh, thanks for the question. Um, we probably only have time for one more question. We've had so many excellent ones in the feed. I will put something in the chat for, uh, for our um, general mailboxes in New York and Connecticut. If anyone has a burning question or comment that wants to share with us, um, please do so. But um, probably one more question, Chris. Yeah, Marshall, do you want to tackle, <laughs> this is a funny one for a short question, to tackle the issue of sort of grazing versus climate change and uh, the impact of cattle on climate and such and how this program is might be a little different from the norm? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, it, it was always very important for us uh, to uh, make sure, and I think this is true across any industry, uh, to make sure we are tracking and reducing our footprint. And that is certainly true within uh, agriculture and specifically within uh, animal agriculture. And so uh, a big part of grassland bird health is in, in facilitating greater grassland ecosystem health. And a big part of that is soil health. And as we increase the grassland bird, uh, uh, grassland health, we're seeing that uh, and we anticipate that more carbon can be sequestered out of the atmosphere and over time offset the uh, emissions from uh, uh, the cattle. And it's important to, to place that in context. You know, large native herbivores that emit uh, methane, for, for example, uh, have been on the landscape uh, since the landscape was sort of there, right? They were 35 million elk and 30 million or between 30 and 70 million uh, bison and other large ruminants. So um, it's really important that we reduce that footprint. And we the science is ever more showing that grasslands can be an incredible sink for and a reliable sink for uh, carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and it, it's gonna be, it's gonna remain important for us to balance, right? Biodiversity, uh, climate, our climate future and all of those things together. Uh, and, and this is a program that we are very optimistic can be a part of that solution, uh, but it begins with reducing the amount of emissions um, uh, within the sector. Well, that, I do, Rich? I'm afraid that's all the time we do have today, but um, I want to thank everyone for joining us and uh, please tune in on May 19th for the next webinar series as ornithologist and author Dr. J. Drew Lanham will present us uh, on a very important topic, um, coloring the conservation conversation. But I want to thank Chris and Suzanne for assisting us today and certainly to you, Marshall, for a very fascinating presentation. Thank you. Absolutely.